All right, so um, very similar to the work that Nathaniel has, has shown you all, um, I am working in Sleeping Bear Dunes, and we'll talk about, um, do a little review actually on breasts, similar to how um, what Nathaniel described. So if you didn't get it the first time, we'll, we'll try it again here, and then I'll talk about how we're linking this into the CMEX framework. Um, so at Sleeping Bear Dunes, we have sonar and LIDAR data, um, and together, um, those are oops, um, two meter data um, across the entire area. And we do not have full coverage um, backscatter. We just have it for some of these bays here, which are a little bit deeper. Um, so m many of our analyses don't, don't include backscatter as well. Um, the depth ranges from zero to negative 71 meters. Next slide, please. Okay, so breast, what it does is it has an inner and an outer radius. And from that, from the center cell of those, radi those radii, um, it measures elevation change in eight different directions. And so it assesses it if it's higher, lower, or no change. And then these eight values are put together um, and provide each cell a score. These different scores, there's only so many options. So these different scores are grouped together into a segment or a kernel. And then these kernels are um, looked up, you can look up these different values in the lookup table, which gives you the different um, types of geomorphology that breast is identifying. So flat, peak, ridge, et cetera. Um, and so because the inner annulus seems to be such an important part of this, we thought it needed just a little bit more discussion and thought. So next slide. So like, um, like Nathaniel talked about, the minimum mapping unit is the smallest identifiable, identifiable object in the data set. And so with our data, with two meter data, we found that our uh, minimum mapping unit was around 36 meters squared. Um, and so that's how we determined our inner annulus. And so if we look at a couple of examples here um, from the sonar data, you can see some of these sonar artifacts. Um, we see different scar lines and pock marks the width of that um, scar line is approximately um, six kilometers um, across and then obviously much longer. Um, and then the pock marks are, uh, have a, a diameter of six meters as well. And so, um, so some things that we are, um, sorry, so, um, Making sure that our inner annulus is that six meter is, is kind of important for moving forward. The outer annulus, as Nathaniel said, just doesn't matter as much or, or so far as we, we've assessed. So next slide. Okay, so the other parameters, we have our six to 50 meters squared or three to 25 pixels. Um, four classes is what we chose because it just simplifies the outputs. Um, and then we also use two different flatness angles. So one degree flatness angle is the lower angle, lower relief features, and then three degrees is the steeper angle or higher relief features. And to look at, um, sorry, next slide. To look at what these outputs look like, we have the coarser um, higher relief features under the three degree slope, and then the finer features at the one degree slope. And so um, the one degree flatness angle is important for managers because it does pull out a lot of a lot more features in the Sleeping Bear Dunes region. Um, some other regions, this might be different. You might not want all those fine features. But the nice part about running breasts at these two different um, relief angles is that you know it does provide a scalable or a nested output. And so after here, um, next slide, please, please. There's a lot of cleanup that needs to happen. And um, to kind of pull out some of those artifacts that just happen with the breast outputs, but also um, um, stay with our minimum mapping units. So for each of these kernels or landforms, we convert it into a polygon. And then from there, we um, calculate the area of each of those polygons and eliminate everything that is 36 meters squared or smaller and using a majority neighborhood fill to fill those in. Um, and then once these two flatness angle outputs are, are cleaned up, we add those 
together. And so um, the interesting thing about minimum mapping units is not always a, you know, three by three square. We find, you know, that area in all different shapes. So it feels a lot like playing Tetris when you're looking around and trying to identify which, um, which of these features are meaningful and which of them can be kind of just merged into the neighbors. So next slide. So here's an example. If you can see these little black pixels, those are the, um, the areas that we think are too small to really clearly be a feature and to, to identify these. Um, we use one meter contours, which are the black lines on this map here, and then a multi-directional hill shade. And so oftentimes these, these uh, minimum map, these units that are smaller than our minimum mapping um, unit don't really show up as a feature that has much meaning for management or in the final output. It just makes it a little bit too messy. Uh, all right, next slide. And then the simple way that we combine these is we just did some raster addition. So we took the three degree breaths and converted that raster to hundreds and then maintained the one degree breaths at um, single digits and added those together. And so um, similar to Nathaniel's, you can still you can see you know what the coarse scale and the fine scale um, results are when you add these together. And then from here, we determined how the different classes sort of related to the um, more coarse feature. Next slide. So how do we get from breasts, which has a fairly simple output of just bathymetric features into the CMEX um, framework? And so the, um, the flat ridge slope depression really fits well into some of these geologic origin features. So, you know, flat is, is flat. Um, and then one of the uh, flat categories is low slope change on a flat. So these are, you know, lower slope features. Ridges can be defined into eskers, serpent canes, different noses, slope, scarp, slumps, and so on. There's more um, classes than I'm showing here. And then various different types of depression. And so while there's single features that we can identify, there's also this idea of complexes. And so um, with these outputs, we can start to look at some of those complexes. So next slide. All right, so the first one, we're first complex we're gonna look at is in breath, it comes out as a ridge depression complex, but then in CMEX, we can identify this geoform as a ground moraine feature. And so this approach really gives us a more nested approach to com combo the breast and the CMEX output. And we really see the, out the breast output having additional attribute columns that add CMEX in. And by identifying the complexes, we kind of lump all the details together and um, make it so that managers can adjust whatever, whatever map outputs they want to view what they need to to do for their management objectives. Okay, next slide. All right, so the ground moraine, um, this is an elevation profile of these ground moraines. Um, the pink are the ridges and the blue are the depressions from the breast output. Um, and some of these uh, elevation, these elevation changes are no more than two, three, five feet um, change between the top of the ridge and the bottom of the depression. And so doing this finer scale um, or lower slope angle breast output really gives us the ability to identify some of these features that are important for management um, in this region. Next slide. We can go a little bit further with the breast um, or I guess with the CMEX output and or the breast output into CMEX and identify some of these ridges are actually serpent, most likely serpent canes. Um, they have a directional um, feature, or I guess directional the direction to them, um, which indicates um, so, you know, more significant glacial drainage. And a lot of time what we see around Sleeping Bear Dunes is a lot of sand kind of filling in some of these, some of these different regions. And so maybe that's, sand collapse and sediment transport filling in, you know, 
moraine features that are more dominant across the land of the, across the bathy environment, we're not completely sure, but it's something to kind of look into and um, discuss a little bit more. Next slide. In addition to the ground moraine and the serpent caves, we have an esker here um, labeled in black and eskers achieve a level one in the CMAC, or this esker in particular is level one, which means it's greater than one kilometer in length or area in the in the CMEX documents, whereas level two is, is smaller in extent being less than one kilometer in length or uh, length or area. Next slide. Okay, the next feature that we see a lot as a complex are the idea of slump scarp complexes and um, scarps are steep walls and they're often paired with a slump or kind of a, um, a loss of sediment down a slope and so we have various two different types we have erosional scarps and then beach scarps as well which i'll show you here next slide so here's one of the you know more infamous i guess um erosional slump scarp complexes at sleeping bear this is sleeping bear point and in um, 1995 the dunes slid into the lake and um, distributed over 1 million cubic meters of sediment and extended three to four kilometers offshore um, we're waiting on some more data to look at the extent of this um, slump but these areas are really important for management because they often um, really get dense mats of Clodophora and create sometimes Clodophora graveyards. Next slide. Okay, so here there's a couple of elevation profiles. We can see a steeper slope with depositional characteristics coming down. One of these um, scarp clump, uh, scarp slump features and then kind of the bounding levees that um, facilitate some of the transport down down the down the slope um, and so in this with this breast output one thing that's a little bit hard to identify are the scarp walls due to the steeper slope it kind of gets lumped into these ridges and it's something that we wanted to pull out a little more specifically so if you can go to the next slide, please. Here by using um, the 15 and 20 degree contour lines developed from the Bathy data, we can identify both erosional and beach scarps kind of along the, the extent of the um, shoreline and within some of these bays. The one um, uh, scarp wall, you can see that's a little more lakeside where the bathymetry ends is most likely a relic beach. And so, you know, if you're one of the groups studying different lake level changes, these data might be kind of of interest to you. Um, next slide. So Good Harbor Bay, which is um, probably one of the more complex embayments in, in the Sleeping Bear Dunes National Park, or sorry, uh, National Lakeshore. Um, and it's pretty complex. As you can see from this breast output, there's a lot going on here. Um, and so we'll talk about some of the features we've pulled out here and by no means is it all of them. So next slide. Okay, so um, along the beach in red, we have the beach slump and some, um, some of, you can see in the hill shade, some of the slump is not um, captured and that's because those are just lower slope angle slumps. They are actually captured in the other data in the other parts of the breast output, uh, but I just wanted to hi highlight some of the steeper um, slump here, or I guess scarp and slump. Um, we have a beach berm in green, which is a little bit hard to see kind of um, along the uh, southwest shore there of the bay. Um, we have the platform, which everybody in the region calls the reef. Um, and on top of that platform, um, in the hill shade, you can see that some moraine features that also exist on there. Um, a washover fan in yellow, so most likely an older delta when lake levels were lower. And then the kettle, which also is often called the sinkhole, um, 
which is likely derived from some large ice chunk sitting in, in that part of the lake for a longer period of time. Um, a, a submerged channel as well with a thalweg, which has a slightly different slope and is it's deeper than, than the regular submerged channel. Um, and so these are just, I mean, if you're looking at the hillshade, you could probably see other features um, in, this, in this view. And those we have yet to um, fully classify with the CMEX um, framework. But overall, you know, I think putting all these individual features and complexes together really gets us more into that CMEX framework that it um, and what we want to use to, you know, more consistently map um, bathymetric habitats across the Great Lakes. And so ideally the final data set will be scalable and nested for managers to pull out whatever they need for different assessments. And um, from here, once we get the geoform fairly well solidified, we can move into the substrate and biotic components. So next slide. Thank you. Um, so we, since we do not have full coverage backscatter, which would help with substrate, classification, we can use the geoform as a proxy. And so to do this, we have over 500 videos of the bottom, and I think more that haven't totally made it to my desk quite yet, um, but we can look at the different geoform location or different ge geoform types, such as the ridge depression and moraine complexes, and then start to work into the substrate. So often we see in these marine complexes coarse unconsolidated sediments, and these really range from gravel to sand. So some of the texture components of the bathy outputs will help us get to those um, different areas within the park. Next slide. And to more consistently and uh, maybe more simply classify a lot of our bottom videos, we created this a diagram of uh, CMEX with ample examples of how we classified each of these different um, subclasses and groups of substrate um, through this um, through this diagram. And not only is this helpful for um, my crew doing um, the bottom uh, video review, but also for future mapping references in the Great Lakes or other regions to see what and how we classified different features. Next slide. And so a couple of things that we found um, at the bottom of um, Sleeping Bear Dunes are um, a sediment that is not in the CMEX um, classification quite yet, but has been identified in other parts of Lake Michigan, I think in the sanctuary as well, um, is a fine consolidated sediment, which is a hard packed clay feature. And so these are, now that we're, you know, attuned to seeing these, these typically do not have um, any algae or mussels colonizing on them because of that fine substrate um, or the fine grain size of the clay, the, the mussels just can't attach to, to that. And so without mussels, it's a little harder for algae to attach to the clay as well. And in these two images here, you can see the angular clay formations. Um, and this is at the bottom of the kettle, I believe. And then the other um, biotic component that we are looking to adapt is creating a co-occurring element. So CMEX has made flexible enough to kind of integrate whatever features you're kind of seeing over and over as um, co-occurring. And um, this is the muscle algae co-occurring element where muscles attach, muscles typically if they're attached muscles, uh, attached to um, gravel and boulders and rock substrate, and then the algae attaches to those. So in that top um, image there, you can kind of see the Clodophora just totally covering the um, gravel substrate with some muscle hash in the white, if you can tell that. Um, muscle beds where muscles are attaching in a sandy substrate are harder to assume um, across the entire extent. Um, next slide. But with that, um, that's all I have. And here is an image from North Manitou. It seems to be forgotten in a lot of the work, but it is still there and we are mapping it. And um, 
If you have any questions, pop those in the box and contact me with any questions or um, information you might have. Thanks. Great, thanks, Jamie. That was a really, really interesting presentation and obviously complementary to the previous presentation. Um, just a reminder that folks can pop any questions they have into the question box. Um, so one question, uh, Jamie, obviously this kind of work has huge implications, you know, for better understanding the kinds of habitats on the lake bed and, you know, how the, where and how the fish um, may be using the lake bottom. So this might be getting ahead of kind of where the mapping is at, but do you know how um, the CMEX or the breast classifications might be reconciled with the way that, for example, fish habitat is described in management plans? You know, for example, there may be legal implications for the way habitat is described for an aquatic species at risk. Um, and do you know if, you know, how it's, how the classifications are in CMEX are, um, you know, re reconciled with those kinds of descriptions of habitat? Um, you know, I, I don't know exactly how those are paired, but I think if a manager or I guess a common person looking for fish habitat could pull out those um, different map attributes and identify regions where fish habitats could exist, given, you know, rocky substrate about this size or whatever it might be that that they could start to identify those different habitats with the different um, map layers that we're producing great thank you we don't have any more oh here we do have a question um so I think the question the, about the absence of, I assume this is backscatter data, um, it was mentioned in both of your, your presentation and Nathaniel's presentations. Um, and can you speak to whether that's a technological problem or for some other reason that there seems to be um, an absence of backscatter data? Yeah, so um, in Sleeping Bear Dunes, uh, a good, I don't want to say majority of the data that we have um, is LIDAR. And so there are people working on getting backset, backscatter similar data from the LIDAR, but we just don't have that quite yet. So anywhere that's near shore, so anything you know more shallow than 12 meters or so isn't going to have backscatter. Everything deeper when it's collected in tandem with sonar will have backscatter. Um, and so really for anything deeper than 12 meters we have backscatter but it's so spotty when you're running breasts it's you'd have to run each part that has backscatter separate and then put all of those parts back together um and it would it would be a little more challenging to fit it into the breast model and i see that brandon corrected me so the newer lidar does have reflectance or backscatter information with it um, these data that we have are a little bit older and I don't know if it does, but he'll probably correct me anyway. So that's kind of the, the reasoning behind that. And sometimes there's just a lot of errors in the data collection, so it's not super reliable. Great, thank you. Um, are there any plans to merge the geoform with the existing substrate and biotic component of the CMEX classification? To merge the geoform with the substrate and biotic? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think once we get to that point, we'll have um, hopefully, I mean, ideally the substrate and the geoform will match to a certain degree and then the biotic within that um, as well. Um, just because in Sleeping Bear Dunes, they're, they're pretty highly correlated to one another. Um, and then the output of, or I guess the data package of all of that will have um, each of those different components together as like a product someone could download or whatever. 
Is this is this um, speaking of downloading? Is this work that you guys are working on now? Will that be made available to the public? Oh, the stuff we have from today. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe it's not totally finished yet, but if someone wants to shoot me an email, I'd be willing to discuss um, something if we talk to some of the parks people and see what um, what you guys want. Great. Um, and then we do have another question um, on the second slide, I, I believe. Um, how you manage to correct the errors from the bathymetric overlay yeah so the the hill shade so yeah with the sonar data with the striping is that the question yes yeah so um there were some areas where i had to do a lot of manual editing to the um to the breast outputs but generally not that much and so one way we can kind of get around that is using um the different slope angles and um kind of cleaning up the data according to those so the the higher the slope angle the less those artifacts are integrated into the data set so um the lower slope angle does pick up some of those scan line errors but not to a great degree um and i think some nathaniel's dealt with this a lot more at our royal than i have in sleeping bear but um i think they did oh Okay, yeah, I think they did do, um, they changed the resolution to much coarser to get rid of some of those scan line errors and other errors that they had in their data. Ours are not great enough that they really impact the, the data too much. 